all planets are spherical, all dogs are brown, and all smurgles are flumpy. These three sentences have the same structure, but they don't have the same meaning. The first one is true, the second one is false, and the third one is nonsensical, at least as far as I know. I'm not actually an expert on smurgles. This distinction between the structure of a sentence and its meaning becomes really interesting in the language that sits all the way at the foundations of mathematics. We will first look at its structure, then its meaning, and then we will figure out if this distinction actually matters or not. In a human language like English, the structure of sentences is dictated by the grammar of the language, also known as the syntax. Mathematical logic is a more formal kind of language, but it also has a syntax, which tells you what kinds of structures are allowed for logical sentences and expressions. When you mathematically prove something, you basically manipulate these structures in order to get from where you are to what you want to prove. In this view, mathematics is nothing but blind symbol manipulation. It doesn't care about the meaning of a sentence at all. It just mindlessly applies all the rules like a good little robot. A logic system typically starts from a small number of sentences that are given. They are accepted without proof. These are called the axioms of the system. They are taken to be so self-evidently true that they require no proof. Using the axioms as your starting point, you then apply inference rules to infer new facts about the world. This is what a mathematical proof looks like. It follows logical rules from the given facts to the new facts that you want to prove. Every time you prove a new fact, you can add it to the total bag of all knowledge. The bag starts out with only the axioms inside, and then it grows over the centuries as mathematicians manage to prove new things. Whenever we prove one sentence from another, we write it with this turnstile, a letter T turned on its side. So this turnstile symbol indicates that you were able to find a path from the first sentence to the second by blindly applying the purely structural syntactic rules of logic, ignoring the meaning of anything that happens along the way. In principle, you can choose your own set of axioms freely, so you can come up with your own new, weird kinds of logic. But in practice, we want our axioms to have certain properties. We want them to be simple. We want the set of axioms to be as small and manageable as possible. We also prefer to pick a set of axioms that leads to an interesting or useful theory. For example, the axioms of set theory and arithmetic allow us to describe the real physical world very accurately. And that is why we decide to use those axioms instead of others. Ultimately, physical reality informs our mathematical choices. The study of mathematical proofs that are based on syntax, on axioms and inference rules, is called proof theory. When you study proof theory, you will inevitably run into the name of Gerhard Gensen. He came up with a very elegant set of axioms and inference rules. The basic idea is that your logical language contains operators, such as AND and OR, or implies. Gensen tells us that for every operator, we only need two inference rules. An introduction rule, which tells us how to introduce the operator into a sentence, and an elimination rule, which tells us how to get rid of the operator. For example, the implication operator, the left-right arrow that you see in so many mathematical proofs, can be eliminated like this. If you know that A is true, and you know that B follows from A, then you now know that B is true. This new sentence, this standalone B, no longer contains the arrow. We have effectively eliminated it. In philosophy, this specific inference is known as modus ponens, 
but now we see that it's just a special kind of elimination rule. To introduce an arrow, you first have to get yourself into a very specific situation. Say that we have been able to prove Q from a potentially large set of other sentences. Take one of those sentences, P, and move it to the other side. From the remaining sentences, we can now prove that from P follows Q. So we have effectively introduced an arrow into the sentence on the right. There are more details, but unfortunately those would take us too far. The beauty of Genson's system is that it's simple and symmetric. Two nicely balanced rules per operator, that's all you need. This is just such a clean organizing principle for coming up with good rule sets for various kinds of logic. I really like it. Okay, that covers the syntax of logic, but what about the meaning of logical sentences? The study of meaning is called semantics. When you look up a word in a dictionary, you will notice that it's defined in terms of other words. Those are defined in terms of yet other words and so on. There's really no escaping this. If you want to explain what something means, you will always have to reference other things. You can never explain something in terms of itself. The same is true for the semantics of logic. To define the meaning of a logical sentence, we have to map it to something else. We could map the sentence X is a dog to the set of all dogs. And then X is a brown dog would be mapped to a subset of all the dogs. In order to know if a sentence like Billy is a brown dog is true, we would have to find Billy in the correct set. Again, I'm simplifying here. The goal is to translate all logical expressions and their properties into the language of set theory or group theory or some other mathematical domain. That's how we understand what the logical expressions mean. The mappings don't always have to be so complicated. The easiest kind of mapping simply assigns a value of true or false to all of the simplest sentences. Then, as you construct bigger sentences from smaller ones, you use truth tables to look up the resulting value for the larger sentence. Now that we have this mapping, how does it allow us to infer new facts from old ones? Say you want to find out if the OR operator is commutative. So you start from the assumption that P OR Q is true, and you want to figure out if this logically implies that Q or P is true. The way to do this is to explore all possible mappings. The two variables, P and Q, can both be mapped to false or true, which gives us four different mappings to look at. We then use lookup tables to calculate the truth value for the implication. You will notice that its value is true for all possible mappings. In other words, there can be no fictional universe in which the implication could ever be false. Well then, we can only conclude that it must be logically true. Here's another example, in which the final column contains not only true values, but also false ones. This means that this statement is not true in all possible universes, under all possible mappings. So this time, the right side of the arrow doesn't follow logically from the left. As these examples show, the semantic approach is based on mappings, and it requires you to look at all possible mappings before you can conclude with certainty that one thing follows logically from another. The notation uses a turnstile with two lines instead of one. So this expression means that B follows semantically from A. As you can probably imagine, this approach can create a lot of work. You could have a mathematical expression with dozens of variables, but you could even have to map certain expressions to infinite sets, such as the natural numbers. In order to show that something is true in all of these mappings, it's going to get very tricky very quickly. And so it makes a lot of sense to wonder, 
can't we just use the syntactic approach instead of the semantic one? Let's explore. So we have two different ways of thinking about logical inference. One is purely syntactic. It blindly follows strict rules, such as Gensen's introduction and elimination rules, to derive new facts from old ones. The other approach is semantic. It requires you to look at all possible mappings from sentences to truth values. It explores the meaning of a sentence in terms of some other mathematical domain. Do these two different approaches yield the same results? Or are there important differences between them? Can we always replace one with the other? These are some of the most important questions in mathematical logic. The answers are often subtle and depend heavily on the context. I just want to show you two key concepts here. The first is called soundness. A logical system is sound when you can move from the syntactic approach to the semantic one. So if you manage to prove something using the inference rules of your logic system, then you can rest assured that the thing you have proved is also semantically true. In other words, you can never prove something which then turns out to be semantically false. That's a relief. I hope you feel just how important this is. I mean, a system in which you could prove untrue things would be quite useless. This is why soundness is one of the non-negotiable conditions we will place on any system of logic. If you invent a bunch of new logical operators, the first thing you will have to show, if you want to be taken seriously by the mathematical community, is that your system is sound. But what about the other direction? This is covered by the concept of completeness. A logic system is complete if you can move from the semantic approach to the syntactic one. So if you manage to show that a sentence is semantically true, then you will also always be able to find a syntactic proof for your sentence. Your system is complete because it can prove everything that is true. Unlike soundness, completeness is negotiable. In fact, it turns out that most of the logical systems that we use in math every day are incomplete. This was shown by the brilliant Austrian logician Kurt Gödel. I might make a more in-depth video about his proof later, because it's incredibly clever and cunning. Just think about what this profound discovery tells us. It says that there are holes in mathematics. There are true statements for which we will never find a proof. If you start from the axioms and you follow the rules, you will be able to reach an infinitude of other sentences. But there are certain regions that you will never be able to reach. And this is not because you just haven't searched long enough yet, or because you haven't discovered certain regions yet. No, these regions are fundamentally unreachable. Gödel provided a mathematical proof for the existence of these holes. It's a proof about mathematics, a weird and delightful kind of self-referential loop. The incompleteness of math is inevitable. We will have to learn to live with it. The main point to take away from this video is that we accept incompleteness, but we would never accept a lack of soundness. Too bad that there are semantically true statements that we will never be able to prove. At least we know that whenever we do manage to prove something, it will always be semantically true. Please like and subscribe, and don't forget the extra content on Patreon. Thanks, and I'll see you soon.